series, um, part nine, and it's entitled For Him Who Gives Me Strength. Um, I can do, depending on your translation, all things or everything or all this. The translation we probably have today is I can do all this through Him who gives me strength. Uh, in the past, that has been translated, I can do everything. So we'll just kind of go with that. I can do everything through Him who gives me strength. Uh, if you were to pick out uh, five most famous verses in the entire Bible that's often quoted by Christians, this is probably one of them, right? I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. It's a famous verse. It's a well-known verse. It's a well and frequently put it verse by many Christians. And at the same time, this is the most often often misquoted verse um, in the Bible as well. Uh, misused, so to speak. Um, misused. Uh, this verse is most often cherished by People who promote positive thinking, um, you know, this, this verse is used often by those people to say, you know what, in Christ, you know, you don't have to think any negative thoughts. Uh, you know, if, as long as you remain in Jesus Christ, um, nothing will go badly. You know, as long as you think positively in Christ, everything will work out. Think positive. You know, don't 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 think negative, and as long as you take that position, everything will work out. They sort of uh, just kind of brush at the surface of, of of the value of this verse, rather than to go deeply into what Paul is really talking about in this verse. So that's what we're going to discover uh, in this uh, chapter, as well as this is the final wrap up of um, uh, the series on Philippians. So we've been talking about a lot of things, but this I think wraps up. The entire um, series in, in a perfect way. What it is that Paul is really trying to focus on as he talks about this verse. Now, um, what is Paul talking about? He says, I can do everything. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. What's he talking about? Is he talking about limitless and endless, infinite possibilities? The potentials that every Christian has in Jesus Christ that, you know, as long as you have faith, everything will work out. You know, if things uh, try to go, you know, stand uh, uh, on your way and go against you, you can fight off all of that and everything will work out eventually. All for those who are trying to work for the gospel. And is that what he's talking about? The positive, the power of positive thinking. Is that what he's talking about? Uh, surely not, because as he's saying, I can do everything. He is actually in a position where he cannot do everything, right? He's in prison. He's in prison. He's about to be executed. And he can do everything? What does everything mean? All this mean? All he can do is to write letters and, you know, to evangelize to uh, limited groups of people. And uh, you know, he couldn't really go to places to evangelize. His activity was extremely limited. Then by saying everything, do you think he meant, yes, you know what, because I'm working for the gospel, God will even eventually bring me out of this jail, too. I can do everything. Is that, is that what he's talking about? Because when you say that, you know what, as I'm spreading you know, the gospel and I got locked up and God will eventually even free me from this jail, to be able to say that certainly sounds like something only a person of strong faith could say or could pull off. Because our natural way of thinking, intentionally or unintentionally, those who has been uh, going to church for a long time, that our natural way of thinking usually follows this pattern, okay? If you're working for the gospel, okay, you're working for the gospel, and you get in trouble next, okay? And then what do you do? You're working for the gospel, you get in trouble, you and the congregants pray hard for you and you yourself and for that situation, what happens? God comes to your rescue, and the gospel continues to be spread. That's the usual pattern of thought that we have, right? If we've been going to church for a long time. You're working for the gospel, and you get in trouble, 
you and your fellows pray hard, and God comes to your rescue, and then the gospel continues to be spread. Well, that's definitely possible, and it does happen from time to time, but that pattern should never be fixed into a formula. Okay? It could, or it may not happen. God may or may not come to your rescue. Then what, what, what's going to happen? If God does not come to your rescue, are you going to curse God? See, we've got to be careful in, you know, in, in this pattern of thinking. Uh, you know, careful that we, we don't uh, turn that into a formula to say, you know what, if I do this, if I do that, if I don't do it, then God's going to do this. You cannot expect a certain outcome. Right? The second you turn that into a formula and you expect that to happen every time it doesn't happen, there's a great chance that you can blame God for everything that's happening. See, he's in a prison and he's saying, you know, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. But think about the time, go back to Acts 16. If you go back to Acts 16, Paul was imprisoned, okay, with Silas, okay? Paul and Silas, they were in prison. And what happened? There was a great there was a great earthquake, yes, okay? When Paul and Silas was in prison, there was a great earthquake that took place, okay? And the jail cells, all the cells just broke open. All the doors flung open, okay? Now, what did Paul do? Did he run out of his jail cells shouting, Yes, I told you I can do everything in Christ. See? No, that's not what he did. Paul and Silas, what did they do? They remained where they were. Doors open and they just didn't do anything. And you're thinking, well, if you're a strong believer in Jesus Christ and you're locked up working for the gospel and God caused the earthquake to save you, why don't you run away? That's God's blessing for you, right? See, we usually follow that pattern of thought to say, well, God did it. God did it. But you've got to think about it. What is God really focused on? If you are focused on what God is focused on, then you will be able to see what it is that God has in mind in that situation. You don't automatically draw a conclusion to say, you know what? This must be the reason why God caused the earthquake. No. Paul and Silas remained exactly where they were. They did not move or flinch until they were properly ordered to be released from the prison. They just sat there. Now, what was happening at that time was when the jailer, the, 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 the keeper of the, the, all, you know, the guard, prison guard, witnessed the earthquake and all the doors flung open, he tried to kill himself, thinking what? Why did he try to kill himself? He tried to kill himself because he thought all the prisoners ran away. And he will be the ultimately responsible person, right? So he said, you know what? I'm going to be executed anyway. I'm going to be tortured. So I'm just going to kill myself, right? That's what he was thinking. And Paul and Silas were able to see that because they were thinking what God was thinking. They were not thinking what the formula, Christian formula, told them to think. You see what I'm saying? We usually follow that pattern, you know? I'm a good Christian. I go to church every Sunday, you know? I, I, I don't break any law. And something nice happens, you think, wow, God must be rewarding me. He may, he may not. But let's not get into a habit of jumping to a conclusion. You know what I mean? And turning a, a certain situation into a formula to say, you know what, God will do this next. Or you know what, for my life, God will reward me this way. God's what. Don't talk or act as if you have figured out God. And turn that into a formula. But Paul and Silas were used to thinking what God was thinking. So when the earthquake happened, and all the cells opened up, they did not do what every other Christian would have done. 
which is to run out of jail, thinking, saying, I can do everything in Jesus Christ. Look, look what's happened. I was spreading the gospel. I got locked up. God freed me. Amen. Hallelujah. Just think about what a great testimony that would be, wouldn't it? That would be a wonderful testimony to say, it's just, you'll be invited by every church. Oh, please come speak to us. Please come speak to us. Yes, I was spreading the gospel, and they were persecuting me. I got locked up. And guess what? There was this great earthquake, and people were paying attention to me. They were like about to cry, and there was a great earthquake. All the doors in the cell, they flung open, and I got out. Amen to Jesus Christ, and everybody shout hallelujah, and they're all crying, and where do I get my offering to? Oh, that was That's a usual pattern of thinking we have. But no, no, no. That's not the point. we got to pay attention to. They were trained. They were, as Paul and Silas, they were trained to think not what every Christian thinks, but they were trained to think what God thinks in that moment and in that situation. And guess what God saw? God saw a frightened, a trembling prison guard who is about to kill himself. See, go back a little bit. We are used to thinking, okay, if you're working for the gospel, you get in trouble, and then you pray hard, God will rescue you, and then the gospel will continue to spread. Now, the problem with that is, the focus is on what? On this pattern of thinking. The focus is on spreading of the gospel. You, you're spreading the gospel. You get in trouble. You pray hard. God rescues you so that the gospel may continue to spread. What's wrong with the gospel continuing to spread? Well, the, the problem is, that too is result-driven. See, we often have this imagery of a God who is desperate to send people off to uh, third world, world countries, you know, to say, you know what, all these people all over the world are dying, so I need you to go do my missions, and I'm like his... You know, uh, terrified, his trembling to say, you know what? I don't have any workers. I don't. I need to complete this mission, and I don't have any people. Come on, recruit them, recruit them. Sign up, sign up. I need to complete this mission. As if God is mission driven. No, no, no. God is people driven, and because God cares for the people, that's why He's sending people to the mission field. And because God cares about you. And what will happen to you through the process of you being recruited and you being trained as a missionary, God's interested in that, so that's why He wants to recruit people for missions. God is not mission-driven. God is people-driven. All of these things will happen so that the mission gospel will continue. No, no, no. Yes, the gospel needs to be spread, but there is something more important than that. Paul and Silas remain in the jail cell. God does not pay attention to the mission. God pays attention to the lost souls. That's what he's interested in. Not the spreading of the gospel. I know that sounds very contradictory and paradoxical, but he's not really interested in the spread of the gospel. He's interested in the spread of the gospel because of the people who will hear the gospel. And once hearing the gospel, they'll be transformed and live new lives. That's why. He's not interested. The spread of the gospel focuses on results. But focusing on the lost soul is about the spread the love of Jesus Christ. That's what it's all about. When the jailer who was about to commit suicide saw that Paul and Silas did not escape, who could escape but did not, he decided to commit his life to Jesus Christ. And guess what? All of his family. All of his family. They all turned their lives to Jesus Christ and said, you know what? I believe in you, Jesus. That's what you call a great testimony. Not just miraculous things. So that's the first point. I can do everything, all things, all this in Jesus Christ through Him who gives me strength does not mean, you know what? As long as I'm a strong believer in Jesus Christ, everything will go my way. 
God will listen to my prayers and God will work towards my benefit and for my well-being, for my interest, and everything will work out. That's not exactly what it means. Although that may happen. That's not exactly what it means. The mission is about the love of Jesus Christ. And the mission is for those who are in immediate need of the love of Jesus Christ. And that's who God saw at that time. The prison guard who was in need of Jesus Christ's touch and His mercy. The jailer came to believe in Jesus Christ, not because Paul and Silas escaped, but because they did not escape. If we will continue to see being able to escape, being able to have God solve all our problems, be the, the essence of every blessing a Christian could receive, then there's a problem to that. Problem being solved equals God's blessing. If you are fixated on that equation, then there's a problem. God may or may not free you. Pardon me for saying this, but you may or may not get married. <laughs> God, I'm desperate. I will only believe in you if you let me get married. Or you I mean, who knows? Your son or your daughter may or may not get into college. I'm sorry. You may or may not complete your dreams. You may or may not achieve that thing that you've been working your entire life for. Believing in God has nothing to do with a certain kind of result. And that's what I'm saying. People, those you know, who promote po the power of positive thinking, you know, in, you know, for Him, you can do everything. It'll all work out. There's a problem with that. Because they're thinking, you know what? Everything will work out. Well, what if it doesn't work out? Then what do you do? Will you continue to tell the person, well, you know what? It didn't work out this time, but it will work out later. It has nothing to do with something working out or not working out. It has nothing to do with that. Now, let's go a little bit deeper into today's situation. What In what context is he saying this? Yes, first of all, he's in jail. But secondly, what in, in what context is he saying this? He's talking to the Philippians, okay, the Philippine believers. If you go to verse 15 uh, through 16, this is what he says. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out for Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you only. Okay? For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once, and when I was in need. Okay? So you know that the Philippian church were, was helping Paul, assisting Paul financially before. When not one church was helping Paul, Philippian church was doing that. And he's saying, <clears throat> this has stopped for a little bit, it seems like, and then it's continuing. Okay? And then he says, verse 14, yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. Okay? And then, he, so he's saying, thank you, thank you for, because he's just received another financial assistance from the Philippian church believers, right? The believers in the Philippian church through uh, Epaphroditus, okay? He's just received a new set of offerings. So he's saying, you know what, thank you. Thank you for sharing my trouble. Thank you for assisting me. And then he says something real strange in verse 11. Look at verse 11. Let's read it together. Ready? Go. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content with whatever the circumstances. I am not saying this because I am what? In need. Also look at verse 17. Let's read it together. Ready? Go. Not what I deserve is one to one more time. Not that I desire this. Not that I desire you. I'm not saying I need these things. Not that I desire your gifts. What is he saying? He's saying, I don't need your money. 
I don't need your money. Now think about this. He's just accepted this offering, right? And he said, thank you, but I don't need your money. Think about that situation from the context, uh, from the perspective of the giver of that offering. You just gave somebody offering, right? And that church with that representative would gladly accept the offering and said, you know what? Thank you, but I don't really need your money. Bye-bye. <laughs> what would you think? And give it back. We're so good. So again, you know that he's not in need of money. That's not what, why he's glad. See, that's, he says, it was good, verse 14, yet it was good of you to share my troubles. It's a good thing that you did, that you sent me money, that you sent financial assistance for the ministry. It's good, but I don't need your money. What does he mean by that? What Paul is saying is, more than the fact that I am thankful for your money, I am all the more thankful and appreciative and grateful of the fact that you are participating in God's ministry. That's what he really wants to say. I am thankful that you are a partner in the gospel. That you are willing to bear the burden and the troubles and go out of your way to assist in God's ministry towards the advancement of the gospel. I'm so happy for that. I am happy that you're participating in the suffering of Jesus Christ. That's what he's really thankful for. Because where else did he say this? If you turn to chapter 3, verse 10 through 11, remember this famous verse, I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of His resurrection and participation in His sufferings, becoming like Him in His death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. That's what he's saying. That's become Paul's life's purpose. My life's purpose is to know Christ and to know Him deeper and better in His sufferings. And Paul is thankful for these Christians in Philippi, not because they're sending him money, but by sending him money. You know, the Philippine church was not that well off. They were themselves struggling both financially and you know, circumstantially. They were suffering themselves as well, but they gathered money to assist them. Paul suffering. And, and as they did, they were also participating in Christ's suffering together. That's why Paul is saying, I am so happy. It's a good thing that you're participating. Paul was participating in the suffering of Christ. And as the Philippine church was participating in the suffering of Paul, they too were participating essentially in the suffering of Jesus Christ. That's what he was thankful for. So in this sense, in that sense, he's talking about, I, I can do everything, when he said, I can do everything through Him who gives me strength. And as he's saying that, he's talking about the power a person of faith has despite the circumstance, despite the situation. The power that says, that is able to say, I know you will work it out. Person who is focused on God and not the things that He could do for you. Person who is able to say, you know what? Thank you, regardless of what might happen. When things are dark and faith, faith that is able to say, I'm sure God knows the way. See, for Paul, his riches did not make him proud. For Paul, his poverty did not make him afraid. For Paul, he did not seek true joy in the earthly abundance. On the other hand, he did not think true joy is found in the exact opposite. You know, he, he did Paul said, you know what, it's not about the riches, it's not about the position. But at the same time, he never said that it's the exact opposite. It's, he never said it's about no possession. See, seeking possession has nothing to do with knowing Christ. Seeking no possession 
has nothing to do with knowing Jesus Christ in a deeper and more profound way. Because think about it, we have both camps, right? People who emphasize, you know what? You believe in God, right? For the blessings. Everything will work out. The positive thinkers. I'm not saying positive thinking is bad, but people who automatically expect everything to work out because you believe in God. Seeking possession, in a way, abundance, riches, positive thinkers. That has nothing to do with the gospel. That has nothing to do with knowing. Seeking no possession, you know, if you say, you know, if you're a Christian, especially if you're a pastor, oh, you should be paid next to nothing because you believe in God. God's going to make everything work out. You don't believe that? Oh, you're a person of little faith. You don't, you don't qualify to be a pastor at this church. You're not holy enough, right? Seeking no possession, that's not what he's talking about because what? Both find their basis on possession. If you say gospel or knowing God is all about possession, no. Or no possession, no. Both find their basis on possession. It has nothing to do with possession in the first place. So that's why Paul is saying, you know what? I have found a secret. I know what it is to be in need. See? I know what it is to be in need in verse 12. And I know what it is to have plenty. See? See, he would not be able to say that if he never had the experience of eating caviar. He would never be able to say that if he never had the experience of sleeping in a five-star hotel. You know, pastors could, too, drive a nice car. I'm not saying that that should be the ultimate goal and purpose in life. But it's possible. It's also possible that pastors don't drive anything. See, Paul has put himself through both situations. I know what it is to be me. In poverty, I know what it is to have plenty, a lot of money. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. That's what he said. I can do all this, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. So, rather than talking about the ability to overcome anything. He's talking about the heart that is ready, the mind that is open to experience anything that God may throw in your way because you believe in Jesus Christ. Because you're willing to participate in His sufferings. That's what He's talking about. I can do anything in Christ. I can put myself through anything for Christ. Because to know Him deeper in His sufferings is to eventually arrive at a point where you can say, you know what? I have lived a good life. I have lived an abundant life. None of the dreams that I saw in this world was achieved, but I have achieved everything in Christ. That's what He's talking about. The focus is... In Christ, through Him who gives me strength. In Christ is the purpose. Knowing Christ is the purpose. See, listen, if poverty helps you to know Christ better, then hallelujah. If riches helps you know Christ better, then hallelujah too. Don't tell yourself, only if you make me rich, I'll get to know you better. Don't ever say, only if you make me poor and I'll intentionally, purposefully put myself in poverty that I'll look at you. You may or you may not. That's the problem with some of the, you know, the, the, the you know, Buddhists. You know, they say, oh, it's, it's about no possession. It's about believing in no possession, right? And, and so they intentionally abandon everything, family, uh, wealth, fame, and they just intentionally blame, you know, abandon everything. Because they believe in achieving no possession. But it's not about that. Whatever helps you to know Christ better. That's what it's all about. Turn to Proverbs chapter 30, verse 7 through 8. I'll actually read through, through 9. But, uh, listen. This is Solomon's confession. Two things I ask of you, Lord. Two things.
Do not refuse me before I die. Keep falsehood and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Otherwise, I may have too much to disown you and say, Who is the Lord? Or I may become poor and steal and so dishonor the name of my God. See, see, what's the purpose here? If you give me too much, don't, don't make me too rich because I may forget you, God. Don't make me so poor and have me steal. Have me be tempted to steal other people's property because that way I may dishonor your name. The focus is on what? Possession or no possession? No. The focus is on God. I may disown you. I may bring disgrace to your name. The focus for all the great believers in God was on God. I'm afraid my certain situation will draw me farther away from you. I'm afraid that my certain situation will result into a, a certain type of disgrace of your name. I'm afraid that my relationship with you will be suffered because of a certain situation that you may give me. So you know what? I want to know the secret of enduring anything, whether it be riches or poverty, in sickness or in health. The focus is you, God. I want to know you and the power of His resurrection. The purpose, folks, is God. So, folks, that's what that verse is all about. Through Christ, through Him, I can do everything means. For as long as, you know what, I know that God loves me and I love God, I know that whatever happens, whatever happens, God will ultimately use that circumstance towards the greater good, both for my life and for the ministry, and for the advancement of God's kingdom. May that happen, Lord. I can do anything in Christ. I can face anything. I will be open-minded towards anything that God may throw in my way. Because I am even ready to participate in His suffering. Not only am I ready for that, but I know I am convinced that to participate in his sufferings is the way to get to know God better. So folks, you don't thank God because God has done something in your life. A mature Christian comes to a point where you thank God whether or not God has perform something in your life. You come to a place, you say, you know what? I thank you in any and every circumstances. You come to confess the confession that Habakkuk made in the old days. Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 17 through 18. Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crops fails, and the fields produce no food, Though there are no sheep in the pen, and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. I can do everything through Him who gives me strength. It's not about achievement. It's not about no achievement. It's all about your participation in Christ's suffering so that you may get to know God better. And when you know God better, everything will be given to you. 
everything that you need in this life. Do you think you know better what God knows better? Of course God. And that will be given to you. Seek ye first His righteousness and the kingdom of God and everything, I mean everything, will be given to you. And that's the promise of the Scripture. Let's sing that song one more time. Um, knowing you. Uh, we can just uh, yeah, have the, the keyboard. Instead of the uh, response of him, let's sing that together. Think about the Think about the lyric as we sing it. to the Philippians where Paul wrote a letter to his fellow believers in the church of Philippi while being imprisoned. He taught them of the joy that he has. He taught them and shared with them about the secret of being able to rejoice while whether he was fed or hungry, whether he was living in plenty or in want, whether he was in need, 
or had plenty. He was sharing with them the secret of being content in every and any situation. And he was ultimately able to tell them, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. And this is because he had made his life's purpose in knowing Christ. And to know Christ, he gladly participated in his sufferings, in his death, and in his resurrection. We too want to know Jesus Christ. We want to know the power of your resurrection. And before we come to know the power of resurrection, we first want to participate in your sufferings. So teach us, Lord, what it is to participate in your sufferings and in your agony. So that we may learn and master the secret of being content in every situation, Lord. Teach us to be more like you. Teach us to walk the path of Calvary so that we too may participate in your resurrection. May this message shine light in all of our paths. Those who are walking through the desert. Those who are walking through the shadow of the valley of no hope. May this message continue to shine light in our lives. Help us to cherish not just your glory, but your suffering as well. Thank you, in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.